Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. It's my pleasure as director of the Toby Center for Jewish Life and Learning to welcome you to today's TJC Talks session. This is a special edition in partnership with our friends at the Krakow Jewish Culture Festival in celebration of its 30, the festival's 30th anniversary. So before we begin, Mazal Tov to Janusz and the team. Looking forward to being with you next year at the 31st. So before I introduce our guests, a few guidelines. Our conversation will last approximately 45 minutes and will be followed by a traditional Q&A session for about 15. Please do let us know where you are at the moment and if you'd like to submit a question or a comment, you may do so in the comment section. As many of you may know, and to those of you who are new, welcome, welcome. TJHT Talks brings an array of perspectives on Polish Jewish history and heritage, culture, and life. We hope that each session provides you with yet another piece of the puzzle or perhaps a new perspective, or perhaps even raises more questions and your curiosity. Today, we have the opportunity to learn about yet another important facet of who we are and what we do, who we've been and where we're going, it's about the renewal of Jewish culture in Poland from a personal perspective. So it's my privilege to introduce two friends, one recently made, Yossi Klein Halevi, and one long-standing, I didn't want to say old Janusz, Janusz Makuch. Yossi Klein Halevi is a senior fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. He co-directs the Institute's Muslim Leadership Initiative, which teaches young Americans about Judaism, Jewish identity, and Israel. Halevi's 2013 book, Like Dreamers, won the Jewish Book Council's Everett Book Award, and his 2018 publication, Letters to My Palestinian Neighbors, was a New York Times bestseller. Born in Brooklyn, Yossi moved to Israel in 1982 and now lives in Jerusalem with his wife, Sarah, and their three children. Janusz Makuch, is the founder and director of the Jewish Culture Festival in Krakow. He organized the first edition in 1988 and has developed it into an annual internationally recognized event. Currently, the festival spans 10 days and features more than 200 events presenting contemporary Jewish culture to an international audience of more than 30,000 people. In 2008, Janusz was awarded the Polonia Restituta Order and received the Irene Sendler Award from the Toby Foundation for Jewish Life and Culture. And in 2018, he was awarded the Honorary Friend of Israel. A warm welcome to you both. We are delighted that you are here with us. We understand this is the night before the first day of the festival, so we're happy to inaugurate it. Yossi, the mic is yours. Thank you, Elise. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, Janusz, I, I was listening to the introduction and heard that you had uh, gotten an award as an honorary friend of Israel. I would call you an honorary Israeli. Uh, I would also call you my honorary brother. And uh, I've been so looking forward to, to this conversation and to really have, have a chance to explore with you something about this extraordinary creation that you invented and that you've sustained against all odds. And I've told this to you before, but I would like to say this publicly. Uh, for many years, I, I had no interest in this crazy Jewish culture festival in Krakow. Uh, I was sure that it must be kitsch, bad klezmer music. And as anyone uh, who's been to the festival will know, and as we saw in this terrific clip, uh, the festival is so edgy. Uh, it's so culturally smart and, and sophisticated. Uh, I think that this is the best Jewish culture festival in the world. Now, you, Janos, technically are not Jewish. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, an unusual, it's an unusual profession 
for a non-Jewish Pole to be doing a Jewish culture festival for, for 30 years. So what I'd like to ask you about, and really to start us going, um, let's go back to 1988, the first oh, okay. year of this improbable venture. The communists are still in power in Poland. You are 27, 28. Right. And not yet an internationally known and respected uh, impresario of uh, Jewish culture. What is that first festival like under the communists? I imagine it was not quite legal, and yet the festival begins. What, what put us there? Give us, give us the scene and tell us something about who you are at that moment and why are you doing this? Oh, big questions. Uh, actually, it's a big question, which includes a lot of smaller but very significant questions. So actually, before we start from 1988, uh, I just want to welcome all of you, my beautiful known and unknown friends from all over the world. Hopefully, part of you attended the Jewish Culture Festival, so I'll try not to say too much about it. But, you know, let's see, uh, actually, everything be be began uh, many, many years before 1988. Everything began in my hometown, where I was born in 1960, and the hometown has a name, Puave. It is a small but very historical city. Why it is so important? Because in the end of 18th and, uh, and the 19th century, the very famous Prince Czartoryski family lived over there, and the first two historical museums were opened. So I was, as a young man, overwhelmed by the history. I was really very, very interested with the history. And uh, I thought that I know everything, or well, almost everything, about my hometown which was a partly the history of Poland. Till the moment when I met a very wise man in the bookstore, by the way, I was, or I could be 15 or 16 years old. And his name, by the way, very difficult Polish name was Michał Strzemski. And he gave me this unbelievably important, significant question which was the first turning moment, turning point in my life. He asked me, do you know that one third of the uh, population of our hometown were Jewish people? So being 15 or 16 years old, I heard word Jew in the first time in my life. And you didn't know what it was? Oh, it I had no idea because I, you know, uh, uh, it was still deep, dark communist period. And even I was taught about the uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau, so I was told that the, uh, the, the victims of the Auschwitz-Birkenau were, be careful, Jewish, uh, Polish, Polish citizens. we have never told that they were Jews. So it was the beginning. And he became, you see, my melamed. You know, just my melamed. He said, why don't you come to me? I will teach you. Well, wow, absolutely. And it was beginning. The story is beautiful because on 1980, when I decided to come to Krakow and study over here, he said, I just finished the book about the Jews from Puave, from our hometown. Don't forget, it was in 1980. And he said, why don't you make me a favor? Why don't you take this copy of my manuscript and deliver to the publishing, Catholic publishing house, Znak in Krakow? Of course, I took this manuscript and I found the uh, I found the uh, publishing house, which was that time located very close to the main market square. Mm -hmm. And I opened the door. So I saw the beautiful woman who is sitting around the heavy desk full of uh, books, newspapers, papers. And I introduced myself that time. I look a little bit different. And today, and I put this manuscript in the middle of a table between us, she gave me a cup of tea or coffee, I don't remember, no, tea probably, she didn't have a coffee that time. But the story is that bringing the manuscript of the Jews from Puave, I, I met my, 
my wife, who became my wife six years later. So this is a story about my Jewish world, or the beginning of my Jewish, the meeting acquaintance of the Jewish world. And later, of course, I met also people like me in Krakow, you know, Jews and non-Jews, young people who were desire and hunger of knowledge about the Jewishness. So step by step, we decided to gather and decided to discover this world. And we started to learn Hebrew and Yiddish. And we started to observe the Shabbos and all, all holidays from the, uh, from the calendar. And it was just very spontaneous. 1988, the communist still was in my country. And I decided with a friend of mine, oh, OK, why don't we why don't we organize a Jewish culture festival? I was so brave and crazy at that time to call it Jewish Culture Festival. We didn't think, we didn't plan, we didn't dream that it would become a, one of the most crucial culture, Jewish culture event in the world. That time we just wanted to do something and we did it. And where did you find the performers? Who were they? Oh, of course I found them in Poland. <laughs> because it was just impossible to go abroad. I got my passport in 1990, if I remember perfectly. So I invited the people who, like me and the other people in Poland who were involved, who were interested with the Jewish culture. So they were artists, scholars, uh, 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 painters, sculptors, filmmakers. By the way, it was a time when the first time after the Second World War in 1988, we presented the 13 titles of the Yiddish films, which was were produced in Poland by the Jewish directors, uh, including, of course, Dibuk, Yiddel Mittel Fiddle, Grine Kuzina, etc., etc. So it was just, just amazing. Yeah. It was beginning. And you, um, so you found this, this group, this group of performers. I and... found, but let me let me add one more very important thing. Of course, on the one hand, we had so-called performers, but uh, the festival took place in a very small city, nomen nomen micro, and I was worried about the audience. Uh, so it, did, it didn't happen in Krakow. No, no, it happened in Krakow in the middle of Krakow, but in a theater, which was called Micro. Mm -hmm. Just theater, which could consist 100 people. So my concern was that time that maybe if someone will come, so maybe 10 people, 15 people, 20 people, it was overbooked. I think it was more than 100 people. Mm -hmm. I understand compared to the 15 or 18,000 people nowadays on Sharaka Street, it's nothing. No, it's not nothing. Because, you know, one of the most significant moments, which was unbelievable, I saw the people like you who wore the kippas, yarmulkes, on his head. In 1988, it was a very clear sign sent to the people, to the audience, to the world, we are Jews. We are not afraid to be Jewish. We are proud to be Jewish. Maybe because of the Jewish Culture Festival, maybe not. But it was a first festival, and I thought it would be the last edition. And then, miracle happened. I'm not going to say, I don't dare to say, it's also thanks to the Jewish Culture Festival, but the communists collapsed. When communists collapsed, the new government... So but Janos, the before, before the communists collapsed, they're still in power when you have this festival. Yeah. And how do the authorities respond? Oh, first of all, uh, did you get permission? Me? Permission? Yeah. I've never thought to ask them for any kind of permission. I just did it without vague consciousness. We just did it. And this is one of the most important lessons in my life. Don't mm -hmm. think too much. Don't try to lock. Just if you want to do something, plant the seed. We'll see what happened later. That's what happened with the festival. No, we've never asked the permission. Your first trip to Israel was oh. in the early 90s, right? Yes, it was in 1991. Another turning moment, so-called eternal moment in my life. And I could travel 
to Israel, thank to the uh, friend of mine who passed away a few years ago, many years ago, actually, Miriam Akavia. She was a writer born in Krakow, and she was the, uh, you know, victim of the uh, almost all death camps, but she survived, Baruch Hashem. So <clears throat> she asked me a very, actually, it was a, she asked me, she was almost angry. She asked me, have you ever been to Israel? We met on 19. I think 89, I said, no, I've never been to Israel. So how dare to you organize a Jewish culture festival and you just avoid to be in Israel? I said, you know, I have no passport, I have no money. Okay, I will arrange everything. So she arranged the money for our trip. Why I mentioned that? Because she got the money from the one of the women whom she knew, her name, name of this woman was, was Janina Haubenstock. And Janina Haubenstock was the, of course, she was Polish, but she was the wife of Mr. Haubenstock. And Mr. Haubenstock was born in Puave, in my hometown. So wow. that's why it happened. It's Amazing. just amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And you know, Co Co coincidence or not? Coincidence you know. or not. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I made my first trip. So when I went across the threshold, of Israel and especially of Yerushalayim. When I saw this colorful, diversified, uh, a living, you know, life and the living culture, when I realized that what I see was built by the people who came to Israel for more than 100 countries and all of them schlepped, you know, the heritage of the countries where they spent the centuries, I suddenly, I suddenly experience like illumination. It is it is a place which I to belong. And I made this trip because I wanted to invite one of the uh, most famous Israeli singer at the time. And I invited him. His name is Shlomo Bar and Habrera Hativit. Yes. And can you just imagine 1992, you know, the people who knew nothing about the Moroccan, Indian, Persian, Israeli music, the people who knew literally no Hebrew words, suddenly saw on the stage these amazing, beautiful musicians from Israel who brought this whole Israeli culture, which, you know, came from a different part of the world. And they started to play and they cut the audience in the one second, over 1,000 people got crazy. And it was the first moment when Israeli artists came to Krakow. And after them, oh my God, I just opened the door to the Israel. And it's Israel. Interesting. Is... It's interesting, Anish, you know, um, just before Sarah and I moved to Israel in uh, the summer of 1982, uh, Bayrat TV uh, performed in a synagogue in Manhattan around the corner from where we were living, in Chelsea. And Sarah said, let's go, it's an Israeli band, let's go hear them. And we went and we were just knocked out. You remember they, they would sit cross-legged on, on the carpets on the stage with a sitar and there was an American playing the banjo and, and, uh, and you really felt the, as you described it, the gathering of, uh, of, of the world through this Jewish Jewish prism. And one of the things that I so much appreciate about what you've done with the festival is that you showcase Israeli music. And I think, I think that Israeli music is the strongest uh, cultural achievement of, uh, of Israeli society. I mean, we, we have terrific films, we have uh, television is, is developing. Uh, literature, of course, but Israelis are passionate about their music. Mm -hmm. Nothing gets Israelis going more than 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 the music that that really defines this this country. And you got it, Yanosh. You really connected to that, and even more improbably, you brought it to Poland. One of my most exciting experiences as an Israeli was standing on Soroka Street the last night of the festival. Mm -hmm. I don't know, 15,000 pe young people, young Poles, dancing to these great Israeli bands. 
and it really felt messianic to me. It felt oh, really? like we really? were really, it felt to me, you know, here we are, we're two hours away from Auschwitz and we are celebrating Israeli music in the streets of Krakow. It's, 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 abs you, you just said something which can help all of you, hopefully, ladies and gentlemen, what is a Jewish culture festival about? I don't think that we are, you know, playing with a culture. We are fully aware of a place where we were born, when I was born. Can I perfectly feel, understand with whole deep sorrow that Krakow is, is actually in the shadow of Auschwitz-Birkenau, especially from the Jewish perspective, that the Poland became the biggest Jewish graveyard without the graves. But after many, many years, I understood that the six years of Shoah, six years of Holocaust, I just cannot eclipse the almost 1,000 years of the vibrant Jewish life created in my country, on my soul. So I was wondering many, many years, for many years at the beginning of the festival, how can I pay tribute to the people who were murdered, who disappeared during the one long night when the Germans came to my land, and just during this one long night murdered six million people. Jews, only because they were Jews. How can I commemorate them? And it was also just like illumination. On the one hand, I thought myself, we can still talk about the Holocaust. We can teach about the Holocaust. And uh, we can still repeat, never again, never again, never again. Or call to the people, don't be anti-Semites, don't be anti-Zionists. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. People love to play with words, not me. I decided to do something because the deeds are more important there than words. So what do we do? I thought to myself, if you want to talk about a death, if you want to talk about this tremendous loss, show people the life. If you want to talk about the black color, show them the white color. And that's but what you know, I did. Janusz, but you know, Janos, what you did was was greater than that, because the festival is not just a tribute to the Jewish culture that existed oh, before the Shoah. The festival is a celebration of the Jewish culture and the Israeli culture and diaspora culture that developed that's after the Shoah. And I'll tell you, Janos, the truth: if if it if the festival had only focused on being a tribute to the past. No, 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 no. Yossi, rega, rega, rega. I didn't finish. So when I understood that the life is most important, so I finally found the mission of the festival. I can, I, I, I just defined the mission of the festival. Jewish culture festival in Krakow is about the Jewish life. It is, it presents the living Jewish culture. Oh, absolutely. And I am fully aware that the part 50% of the people who live in Israel are from Ashkenazi countries, and 50% of the people are from Mizrahi sites. And, so, some of us, and some of us in Israel who are Ashkenazi are wannabe Mizrahi. Of course, Nahan. <laughs> so, so the problem, you know, so suddenly I realized, okay, you know what? Even you were crazy enough and brave enough to call it Jewish culture festival. You didn't call it Ashkenazi culture festival. You didn't call it Yiddish festival. You didn't call it Klezmer festival. You called it Jewish culture festival. And beyond my consciousness, I just created this reservoir, this huge space right now filled by the uh, people from all over the world, Jewish people. But being overwhelmed for many, many, many years by the shtetl, by the traditional culture. When I went to Israel, I suddenly understood the most important thing is the center of the Jewish life, which is Israel, and the center of the uh, Israel, which is Yerushalayim, and just let invited people, because their presence on the Polish land 
on this largest Jewish cemetery is nothing else, nothing more like a victory of the life. The legacy left us by Jews is life. So let's celebrate the life. So the Jewish culture festival is about a diversified Jewish life. Janosz, when you, as, as the impresario of the festival, as, as the person who personally chooses the, the components of the festival, what is it in, uh, in Jewish culture and Jewish music, contemporary Jewish music, whether in Israel or, or, or diaspora, that speaks to your soul? What, what, what do you hear? What do you hear that the other people don't quite hear? Oh. Oh. Mm. Okay. Mm. You know, just take a look at the structure of the of the of the music part. It's you, you always almost always have the cantorial music, the Hasidic music, the klezmer music, and the rest. Why I'm so worried about the um, cantorial music? Because cantorial music is nothing more than the, uh, the, 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 the uh, metaphor and realistic connection to the uh, tradition called the temple. So we know from we are. And the Hasidic music with, oh, Yossi, with all Nigunim, we can sing right now this Nigunim. We can sing this Nigunim called the Vekus. This is a mystical music. This is something which, you know, speaks to the God through you. Or maybe the God speaks to the rest of the world through you. So, and of course, the Klezmer movement, which was born in Ukraine and the east of Poland, and was created by Jews. It was, a, you know, the music which was played on the Kassanets, on the, uh, on the holidays, but also in the houses and the palaces of the aristocrats, aristocrats in Poland speaks to me it speaks to me like like landscape like a, like a blowing wind like a color of the uh, of the uh, of the sky like a food on a table like a laugh i can't explain it you know i just i, I can sing it for you but don't ask me to describe it but it's, it's even more than that that's in some ways i understand that because that's really speaking to your Polish soul, there's 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 oh, something no. that's being expressed in the in the traditional Jewish music that developed that was nurtured on that soil. But your soul, Janosz, also resonates to the piyut ensemble, uh, which uh, which brings the Moroccan Jewish tradition in. Dudu oh, Tasa, yeah. who who combines Israeli rock with uh, with Iraqi music. You you bring you you have managed through the festival to encompass the totality of yeah. the Jewish experience. That's that's what I find so so powerful. It is powerful, of course. Lama, I don't know Lama because I I I, I just love this music. You have to, and, you have to uh, don't speak Polish. You have to translate it into English. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> because honestly speaking, it, it's just what you said, it speaks to me. And, uh, you know, for many years I loved, and I still love klezmer music, no doubt, but a real authentic klezmer music, something which plays significant role in the so-called choice, which I used to make is a quality. Plus, I call it authenticity. That's why the Jewish Culture Festival is doing all its best to avoid some kind of the uh, klezmer kitsch, you know, all the time. Even I love it very much. Ayidische Mame or the, uh, you know, Bublitschki, uh, Mublitschki. No, no, no. The tradition is only the source of inspiration. It's like a, forgive me, like a Torah. You have a Torah. And you have a five books of Moses, Moses, and you read it. Why the Torah still lies? Because we still interpret it in a different way. 
it inspires us all the time the same with the music which is very deeply rooted with the uh, with the sacro the music inspires us because this is a most in, uh, under this is a this is the only language Elsie, by the way which can be understand by the people from all over the world so that's why i'm so sensitive and i'm trying to um, you know just just give people everything. Okay, you just inspired me. I tell you something. You see, how many times I were honored with my beloved wife to be in your house at the Shabbat. And this is a great example. Mother Shabbat, what is Shabbat? Shabbat, it's, it's, a, it's a table and we have the two candles and we have a halas and we have a wine. This is the core. This is something which will never be changed. But the rest is the a kingdom of food, different kind of food. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm just putting on the table of a Jewish culture festival in Krakow the different kind of the food, the different kind of the music. I've had, I've had, some, of the best, Janos, I've had some of the best Jewish meals of my life at the festival. That fantastic vegetarian Shabbat from uh, based on the the pre-Holocaust uh, Vilna vegetarian cookbook was just brilliant. And, uh, oh and yes, so I remember. Part, this is really part of the it's the totality of uh, of the Jewish experience. But you know what you also do, what the festival really touches. It's called the Jewish Culture Festival. But for me, and I'm speaking now as a religious person, the festival touches me at a place that's deeper than that it touches me as a religious jew mm -hmm. and there's so much of the festival that that just naturally moves from culture to spirituality back to culture the way in which synagogues are are uh, are brought in oh yeah to uh to the festival there's no boundary between between the secular and the religious in 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 and I and I and I very much again I, I I so much appreciate that in your vision of what Jewish culture is and what the Jewish experience is. And um and so I was wondering if you could just speak speak a little bit about the spiritual side of the festival. Uh, I'll try. It's so difficult to speak about the spiritual aspects, but let's start. I saw you. I'll, 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 I saw you, Janos, standing on the stage in your Bukharan kippa, the impresario of this fantastic concert, and you were in another world. You were transported. I don't know where you were, but you were somewhere else, and I felt watching you this is a religious experience for this guy. Yes, it is. There's no doubt it is. Oh, first of all, Yoshi, uh, I was so lucky to be born as a Pope. Because besides... Oh, oh, I'm so glad to hear you say that. This is the first oh, time I've heard you. So, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm going to hold you through it, Janos. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> you, you have to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that the problem with this... But Yossi just uh, uh, okay. When I when I met actually before I met Yossi Klein Halevi, of course I heard about him a lot. I read his book, and so I called him staying in the middle of a Machne Yuda in a, in in a Yerushalayim, and I introduced myself, and Yossi interrupted me, and he said, "Janus, I know you. Janus, I heard about your festival. I don't want to disappoint you, but I have to confess something." I love Poland. It's not my words, it's Yossi's words. That's what I, when I said that uh, I was lucky to be born as a Pole. Why? Because on the one hand, beside of the anti-Semitism, of course, I realized what, what country it was, what I lost it, but also what I can achieve if I retreat this heritage from, from the deep of my heart. So when I came to Krakow, in 1980, being a 20 years old guy, 
I suddenly discovered Kazimierz. Kazimierz, ladies and gentlemen, which is the uh, one of the oldest Jewish district which survived Second World War, which was found by the, one of the Polish kings in the 1335, which still have a seven gorgeous, beautiful synagogues built mostly in the Renaissance and the Baroque period. One of the oldest Jewish cemetery from 1551, where the uh, most eminent, you know, uh, 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 scholars like uh, Moish, uh, Rabbi Moshe, Israel's uh, Remu and the Natan Nataspira were buried. So when I came here, I felt, you know, you see that, that, that the problem is that bodies, bodies, bodies burn, but souls, Souls do not burn. So we are surrounded by the souls of the people who lived there. It's only the matter of your, I don't know, if you can hear them, if you can hear the voices. When I'm staying on the stage, huge stage, located in the, uh, on the uh, big square called Shiroka Street, which can encompasses like a 15, 18,000 people. And I see these people. So at the same time, I see the people who lived there during the centuries. They are still there. At least they are in my mind and they are in my heart. This is the, uh, some kind of a custom which I've been you know, continue from many, many, many years. Just day before the festival, I'm always visiting the cemetery, the Remu cemetery, when I light the candle for the uh, rabbi Iserles and Natanata Spira and the other rabbis who lived in Krakow, and I ask them to be with us. And they are always with us. You can burn the body, you can never burn the soul. So we are surrounded by the souls, which, are, which is the source of the life. Uh, yes, this is very spiritual and their religious uh, experience. And maybe, you know, maybe something happened which can help you to, to understand me. Uh, for many, many centuries, Jews lived on my soul in Poland. And we called them um, Polish Jews. And many, many years ago, I understood that, of course, according to Halakha, I'm not a Polish Jew, but definitely because, and according to my life, I am a Jewish Pole. And that's who I am. Janos, when we think about the, let's call it the complicated nature of, uh, the relationship between Poles and Jews over the over the the years. Uh, why why do you think it's important to get this relationship right? What why why does it really matter? Why can't we just all move on? Okay, you've got independent Poland now after all these years. We have an independent country. Um, Let's be friends from a distance. Why, why is this intimacy important and who is it important to? Hmm. I think that we shouldn't make mistake, one mistake which is usually made by the people who are trying to discuss the Polish-Jewish-Jewish-Polish relationships. <clears throat> I think that majority of the people who live in Poland don't care about Jews. They don't know them. They know nothing about the history. They are not interested. But minority, the people like me, my goodness, I am 61 right now, but the people like my beloved daughter, who you know works for the Talbot Center and she's one of, of, of these beautiful people from the team who arrange our meeting. So she grew up in the very crazy and very uh, interesting home created by me and my beloved wife. I don't know what happened to us, but we are free of any kind of prejudice, stereotypes, and God forbid, anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. We wanted to know who we are, why, 
in which way? We wanted just simply know who are, were the Jews who left us this legacy of life. The people, the nation who lived almost 1,000 years in our soil and for good and for bad in our lives, especially after Haskalah intertwined, but they shaped, they shaped the cultural and the political and the social, economical, any kind of Polish landscape. You want to speak about real Poland? Let's speak. Let's talk about it. You can't understand yourself, your so-called Polish identity, without taking into consideration how deep influence the Jewish people gave to the Polish Neshume and a Polish might. Oh, absolutely. Don't forget, we are the victims of, uh, of, uh, of the uh, Second World War, and we are the victims of the Second World War and the uh, communism. They just wanted to transform us. And even nowadays, the politics of the current government is, is, is just shameful. So one of the reasons is that I'm used to invite the... Uh, people who are studying seriously the Holocaust, like Jan Tomasz Gross or Jan Grabowski and the other people, because we want to understand who we are, but we will never understand who we Poles are without the knowledge who were the Jews who lived here 1,000 years. Well, what you would well, like... It's matter today, it's matter all the time. And I tell you more. I just, a couple of hours ago, I had a meeting with our volunteers. It's like a 40, 50 people from all over the world, from Rosa, Rosamus or whatever, Erasmus project. They came from the, all over the world, but basically from Europe. And they are the people from Israel, from States, from Ukraine, from Belarusia, from France, from Germany, from uh, 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 India, from Pakistan. Among them are Muslim people. And I asked them, why? Why did you come here? Why it matters for you? And they say, of course, they gave me a different answers, but we want to be in the place where the Jewish civilization flourished. Look, Yossi, all civilization who dream about the eternity collapsed. Only Jewish civilizations survived and still inspires us. I can speak only, you know, from my from my heart. I can speak speak only thinking about myself and my beloved. We belong to this world. This world changed our life, changed our attitude to the world. We are not majority, we are minority. But you know, this is one of the one of the why it matters. Because this is a, one of the ways how we can combat, fight anti-Semitism, which is, which is disease, which is, which is purely evil and, and, and bad. And I tell you, I remember what Rabbi uh, 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 Lord Jonathan Sachs said. By the way, Jonathan Sachs wrote a beautiful, uh, beautiful words towards your, your book. And he said, we can't fight anti-Semitism alone. We need a friends. We need a non-Jewish friends who would be able to stay with us and fight together. We shouldn't be alone. And especially now, yes, why it matters? Especially now, after the last war in Gaza, where almost whole world is against the Israel, moreover, against whole Jews. What, what is going on on the streets on the Manhattan? What is going on on the streets of Bronx, on Queens, on, on Europe? How, you know, the people are afraid to walk to the shul with a kippah on his head. So Krakow, I'm not going to say Poland, but Krakow is this, this, this amazing place where you can meet together and discuss about our identity as a human beings and that's oh, why it matters interesting. it's interesting Janos, because um i thought about this uh the last time i was at the festival that uh this is one of the very few places probably in europe where one can actually feel 
welcome as an Israeli, where Israeli culture is part of the public space. Absolutely. And, uh, and that's, that's, that's a tremendous achievement these days. Yes, and, with all, and you know, just one thing, with all of the understandable Jewish concern about anti-Semitism in Poland, uh, I would really want to point out the, the almost total absence, in my experience, of anti-Zionism, uh, which I consider to be really one of the great threats facing the Jewish people today. And the fact that uh, Israel and Israeliness is so welcome and so natural in, uh, in the Polish public space. That's, I think you had a lot to do with that, Janusz. I think that's, that's, that's well, a festival's you know, achievement. Yes, I understand, Helis. I understand that uh, you want to interrupt us. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but we have to continue that. Uh, so, <laughs> Yossi, for many, many years I said publicly, I, I am a, a Polish Zionist, and I'm proud of that. And more and more people following me. So, yes, this is an Israeli Jewish culture festival in Krakow. I don't know what will be in the future. I can't change the past. So I'm focused on this moment of my life called the Jewish Culture Festival, and I call it, this is the eternal moment on my life. So Zolzain, let it be, Yalla Kadima. Yes, Halis. Oh, we, we can hear you. Oh. Are we good? Yes. Yossi, Janusz, I'm sorry to, ha to have to interrupt you. Um, the conversation Excuse should me. continue. This, oh, it I will. Will. It will. The, the <laughs> conversation, but not just among, between the two of you, but amongst all of us on this call, many of the comments reflect um, different kinds of issues. Um, I just want to share one or two comments because we're coming to a close. But again, these are we're coming to the part of the conversation which really is part of the festival's opening the forum. And I know, I mean, I've, uh, I've lived here in Poland. Janusz, I've known you for a long time um, and I've admired your work. And I also feel very much that what the festival brings is opening spaces for all of us to gather and to get to know one another, as you both have said, Jews, non-Jews, Israelis, Americans, and it's the point where if we want to talk about how to promote a sense of peoplehood, of belonging, of actually being responsible for and to one another, the festival opens the street, literally the street. Yeah, I think there's a very important word, responsibility. Oh, absolutely. We should be respons responsible for each other. Yeah, definitely agree. So one of the, the, the comments I do want to share is, um, from Riva Berelson. Hi, Janusz and Yossi. Oh, <laughs> Mazel tov on 30. Many more happy and healthy festivals are to be enjoyed live. Can't wait to share the music. Thank you for honoring the music of the Bagelman family, which oh. is Riva's family. This so, is amazing. Uh, next year. Story. Do, do we have another hour? I'd love like to tell you about it. I know uh, the Bagelman's music through you, Janusz. Of course, I send it to you. This is yeah. something absolutely amazing. Why it matters, why the Poles started to play this unbelievably beautiful music composed by the, uh, by the uh, David Bagelman. Why? Don't ask too many questions. That Take what it is. Because well, it is our common heritage. That's what I think. Well, we're excited. So, thank you, Riva. Thank you so much. We're excited next year to enjoy the Bagelman family music live all together. Um, yeah, sometimes right. we say next year in Jerusalem, so next year in Krakow and Jerusalem. Um, Okay. Okay. Um, just very one other question, and there are many, but um, Yossi, this one is is really for you um as a person who is promoting and really thinking about dialogue and how complex and complicated it is could you share from your perspective and experiences something for us in poland 
uh, Jews, non-Jews, who are like Janusz at the forefront of all kinds of cultural, social, political, minority rights issues, especially as Janusz pointed out during this time. I really appreciate the question because it gives me uh, a moment to speak about uh, why I love Poland and why I'm in, why I'm here. Uh, I came to Poland for the first time in October 1989, a month after the communists fell and solidarity came out. And it was an extraordinary moment to be in Poland. This was the first country that had succeeded in throwing out Soviet communism. And it's a very long story. I've written a lot about this, but I'll, I'll simply say that what I connected to most deeply uh, is that part of Poland that's very often hardest for Jews to connect to, which was Catholic Poland, the church. And partly it was because of the rise of solidarity. Uh, partly it was the more um, liberal wing of the church that was predominating at that point. Um, it was still under the influence of Pope John Paul, uh, who I wouldn't call him a liberal, but, but certainly in terms of Jewish Christian relations, no one in the history the, of Jewish Christian relations, 2000 years, did more to bring Jews and non-Jews together uh, than the Polish Pope. And what I learned in Poland was that John Paul was not the, the exception, but he was who he was because of his Polishness. And my experience in Poland in 1989, it was my first interfaith experience. It's my first experience crossing those borders and starting to develop a, a curiosity. And it always begins with curiosity. All deep relationships across borders begins with the question, what's it like over there? Hmm. And and so curiosity, and there's a reason why totalitarian regimes uh, try to suppress curiosity, because that is the most subversive step. That leads you into areas, well, here's Janos and I, uh, having uh, gone uh, into each other's worlds, uh, having crossed these borders, uh, having um, been amazed at what we've discovered. I fell in love with the Catholic soul of Poland, with that deep religiosity. Poland is one of the most religious places I've ever been to. And so what I would say is that when we go for deep relationships, when we, when we aspire to take these conversations beyond the polite, um, safe space that so much of interfaith really stays in. Uh, and when you really go deeply and you end mm. up doing the work that Janos has done, which is to go into the deepest part of the Jewish soul and bring it to Poland, that only comes from a willingness to take risks, to open yourself and to go on a journey. And I'm not saying that, that this is something that everyone can or should do, but we do need our people who are, in a way, the antenna of the bug, who, mm -hmm. who go before the bug and are willing to test and, uh, and aren't afraid of, the, of strange experiences. Uh, I, as a, I, as a religious person, as a religious Jew, deepened by my encounter with other religions. It has only, it has only made my capacity for prayer richer. And I think, Yana, something similar I hear from you. You, you, you pray at the festival. You're not just, uh, you're not just presenting culture. And this is, this is taking it to a level of empathy, of a level of deep identification. 
and uh, and I owe I owe a lot of that to Poland in 1989. When you said prayer, I don't know if I should say that, but say it. Say it. Okay, I say it. <laughs> well, all we know, all we know, the words of Yekadish. And we know that this is the prayer for the deaf people. And we know that there is no, literally no word about the death. So it is our Kaddish, the Jewish culture festival in Krakow. It's not a festival. We, we had to call it somehow, but it's not a festival, believe me. I don't want to waste my time to organize a festival. This is something deeper. But I, I want to I want to say something. I want to say something. Do we still have a quarter twenty seven minutes, Elise? I can hear you. Thank God, Baruch Hashem. So I don't know what you did. Yeah, say. that's what people. <laughs> okay, I, yeah. I, I just want to I I just want to say about these two books. Actually, this is in one book. This is a book which was written uh, uh, recently about by uh, Yossi Klein Halevi, mm -hmm. letters to my Palestinian neighbor. And uh, this is amazing and very, very beautifully written. It's, a, it's like a poetry and very wise and very deep and very important book about the uh, uh, Israeli, Palestinian, Jewish, Muslim, human beings relationships. You have to, you have to read it, ladies and gentlemen. And I, I want to also tell you that this book was translated to Polish. By it the was way, translated by by a beautiful woman whom I mm -hmm. love from the bottom of my heart, my wife. So, uh, and it is available also. And you know why I'm showing you because you know you see I really admire not only love you but I really admire you. <laughs> you called it. Look, Yossi called it letters to my Palestinian neighbor, and I'm waiting for someone especially maybe from the younger generation, who would be able finally to write a book called The Letters to My Jewish Neighbors. Not only these who were killed by Germans, by Poles, to my Jewish neighbors. And um, hopefully, uh, before we'll go somewhere, someone will write it and someone will publish it. It's very important. Thank you, Janusz, um, a little bit finding, looking for words to say thank you for bringing empathy and a sense of what we all need to take responsibility for um, in terms of finding ourselves to be empathetic. As you pointed out, Yossi and Janusz as well, curiosity is yeah. where we begin. We take the risk of going on a journey. Absolutely. And as we do this, we begin to not only recognize our neighbors, but to look for, find out who they are and therefore who we are and how we live together in the neighborhood. You both have been incredibly inspiring, and we thank you for your warm Hamish conversation. Jinkuyeme Barzo Yossi and Todaraba Janusz. We are delighted that you've been here with us and we look very much forward to celebrating next year in person in Krakow at the festival. And, and, and until then, we very much look forward here at the Toby Center to continuing these conversations. I also really wanna thank our Associate Director, Alexandra Makuch for her inspiration and our TJHT Talks team, Jakub Bushak and Kaya Shishek. And most importantly, Thank you, dear participants, for joining us. We are supported solely by contributions from you, and we're grateful for those of you who have already donated and contributed. And if you'd like to make a donation in support of this program, you will find information in an email that will follow. We do invite all of you to join us on July 21st for the next episode of TJHT Talks. We invite you to be in touch with us in between if you've been inspired to make a journey to Poland or revisit Poland. And in the meantime, please stay safe and stay well. Thank you so much. Dobrano, good night, Laila Tov, Shalom, in peace. Amen.